we're rolling. Okay, this is an interview at the New York State Military Museum, Saratoga Springs, New York. It is the 5th of, Mar of April, 2005, approximately 10 a.m. Interviewers are Wayne Clark and Mike Russert. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Uh, Eugene uh, James Corsell, uh, July 25th, 1928. I was born at Glens Falls, and I've lived in uh, Saratoga Springs for 77 years all my life. I've been a permanent resident in the city. Okay, what was your educational background prior to entering service? Well, I went through eight years of elementary school at the old number one school on the city's west side, Beekman Street. The school is demolished now. And I had four years of uh, high school at uh, Saratoga High, which is the Lake Avenue Elementary building now. Uh, then after that, I went to work on the railroad. Mm -hmm. uh, I come from a railroad family, and that was in my genes to be a railroad man. I couldn't wait to get out of school uh, to get on the railroad. So I got on the railroad, and I became a locomotive fireman shoveling coal, which didn't create any problem for me because I was a young guy with a strong back and a weak mind, so to speak. But uh, I enjoyed working on the railroad. Uh, like I say, I joined my father and my brothers. They were all railroad people. And uh, I got off the transportation end of it because they wanted to send me to Rouses Point, Canada, which is one step from the Canadian border. And I had to live up there and work on what they call the extra board, which is your work when the regular guy takes a day off. So you might get three days a week, you might get five days a week, or you might get two days a week. But in any event, when the personnel officer said that he wanted to send me to Rouses Point to live and work, I said, I've had it. So after three years, I went into the construction phase of the railroad, and I stood there until I joined the Navy on October 19, 1950. Okay, so you enlisted? I enlisted. I volunteered for the Navy a four-year enlistment. Now, the way it worked was there was five of us fellows working on the, the maintenance, the construction end of the railroad, building a new railroad cutoff in Boston Spa Village. Uh, we all decided the Korean War was on. A lot of the reserves were being called back from World War II. And we decided whoever was classified 1A first, we'd all go and join the Navy, which we did. One of the fellows came up 1A. Unfortunately, when I came up 1A, I was already two years in the military. I was out at sea when my mother sent me to 1A postcard, so I could have maybe beat him out of two years. But in any event, we decided to join the Navy for four years rather than win the Army for two years. Mm -hmm. So we went down to Albany, we all enlisted, and we all went away together. Five uh, fellas had all worked on the railroad together, and we were all from the west side of the city, and we all did our basic training together. Where did you go for basic we went to basic training in Newport, Rhode Island. And uh, from there they moved us out when we graduated after three months of training. And we went down to Portsmouth, Virginia, and we boarded the battleship USS Wisconsin. So I'm very proud to say that I'm a battleship sailor. And that's a, a distinguishing feature uh, in Navy service because uh, the battleship was the big capital ship of the fleet mm -hmm. at that time, mm -hmm. uh, even though you had your carriers coming right along and like that. But in any event, uh, it was a very exciting time. I had never seen a ship as big as a battleship. I mean, my God, there it was. And they says, okay, boys, off the bus and get on the ship. We were going into dry dock the next day. The ship was still in mothballs because the Korean War came on all of a sudden, mm -hmm. and they just needed a lot of people, so they called back a lot of the reserves and us fellows that were enlisting. And we went aboard the ship, and the next day we moved into dry dock, and we did all of our showering and, and eating and like that right on the dock because the ship wasn't ready at all. But we worked right along with the civilian yard crew taking the mothball covers, the cocoons so to speak, off the gun mounts and all the grease that they had, preservatives and like that. So we helped get the ship ready for sea. And after dry dock we made our shakedown crews down Now there. how long did it take to get prepare the ship? Uh, to take oh it, it, took, uh, it took quite a few months. Mm -hmm. Exactly I can't remember but it was a lot of months and then we had a course of a, a recommissioning ceremony where the governor of Wisconsin came down brought a whole load of cheese for us and like that because they're pretty famous for dairy products. But in any event we, had, we got recommissioned and then we went down to uh, Guantanamo Bay, Cuba uh, and uh, had our shakedown crews down there. Uh, then after that, we uh, uh, took a trip over into Europe, Scotland, and uh, Portugal, and then we were on our way to Korea. So we got over into Korea about in, uh, oh, uh, I believe it was late 51, 1951, and we replaced the battleship New Jersey. 
the Missouri had initially been in Korea, then after her time in the bomb line, so to speak, up in the uh, war zone area, they were relieved by the New Jersey, and then we relieved the Wisconsin, and the Iowa relieved us. There were four uh, Iowa-class battleships, and those were the four. But uh, it was very good duty uh, aboard the battleship, a real big uh, heavy ship. It was about 50,000 tons. And, of course, when they fired those 16-inch guns, which is the biggest ships, biggest guns on any ship uh, around the, in anybody's fleet today, it was really something to see, mm -hmm. especially when they fired a nine-gun salvo, which what they call a broadside. When they fired a nine-gun salvo, you'd be sitting here, and the concussion and the, and the repercussion was so great that it moved you like about five foot backwards in the water from the force of the, mm -hmm. the shells going out. When we were shelling over in Korea, what we do, we lay off the coast, and we'd get in pretty close, uh, considering that, you know, we, they didn't have much of an air force, so there wasn't much chance of them coming out with any kind of an air force situation. But what they would do, they had a lot of the, uh, the areas calculated and like that, and what they would do, they'd uh, have their field artillery pieces in the mountainside, and they'd run those field artillery pieces out, and they'd fire one shot over and one shot short, and the next one had you. They'd straddle you, mm -hmm. and then they got you, and they hit us, surprising enough, field artillery pieces, hitting the battleship out in the water. But in any event, the quartermaster on the bridge, he spied where the flash came from, and what he did, they calculated where the, where the artillery piece was in the mountainside, and the captain pulled off, off in the water a little bit further, and he ordered a nine-gun salvo. Well, when they had the nine-gun salvo, you could feel the ship just ricochet back, and the captain announced over the loudspeaker, I can still remember, he says, fellas, we did get hit, and we had about eight or nine guys hurt by shrapnel and like that, but he says, you'll be happy to know where there was a mountain before, there isn't a mountain there anymore. <laughs> we took care of that. <laughs> we, we devastated that area. But um, a lot of uh, exciting things that, that happened over there in Korea is that uh, once in a while you'd corner a railroad train going along the coast, and what they would do, they'd fire ahead of them and stop them, and then they'd fire behind them so they couldn't go anywhere. And then they'd have the anti-aircraft guns, the 40 millimeters, going close. And they'd uh, fire at the boxcars, whatever they were loaded with, munitions and like that. So, the, like I say, they didn't have much of an air force to come out and attack the fleet. and They never did. The whole time the Korean War went on, it was never aerial attacked, any of the ships. Uh, mines, mines were a real bad thing. Uh, a lot of the lighter ships, the destroyers and like that, hit mines and blew their bows off and like that. It was a lot of mine warfare. So basically, in a way, you have to give uh, the communists a lot of credit. Even though they didn't have the facilities like a, a navy or to mount anything, they would cause a lot of problems with their shore batteries and with their mine warfare. Mm -hmm. They're very good at mine warfare. Mm -hmm. What were your specific duties on the ship? I was damage controlman. Really, my rate was a uh, metalsmith. In World War II, they called it a ship fitter. In, uh, in my time, they called it a metalsmith. And now, currently, it's a hull technician. The rating is, uh, is what they call a hull technician. But my job was anything involved in metal, I had to take care of it. That's welding, fabricating, and like that. And in case the ship was hit, one section of the ship was assigned to my crew, and we, in case we got hit, took a uh, hit or uh, caused any damage and like that, we had to go fix it. In other words, we kept the ship afloat. They call us damage controlmen for general quarters duty and like that. But I could distinctly remember the day that we got hit. Of course, where my station was at, I had that much metal over my head, about a foot of armor plating mm -hmm. uh, from the, the, the main deck area down. And I could hear the shell hit. And I said, you know, we, we, were, we were all sitting there like that, and uh, we said that, I think we got hit, and then it came over the loudspeaker that, you know, uh, call it away the hospital parties, corpsmen and like that. But um, uh, we had damage control duties, and that meant keeping, keeping the ship watertight and preserving, you know, the integrity of the ship in case you did take a, a hit any place. Mm -hmm. Of course, we only had certain sections of the ship. Everybody was assigned a certain uh, area to, to look, look after. So basically, I really enjoyed my four years in the Navy. I think I went to 25 countries after the war service, and like that, I've been across the equator, the international date line, and the Arctic Circle. Unfortunately, I got my tattoo, which uh, I'm not too proud about, but I've been living with it here for about 50 years anyhow. I call it an idiot mark, and uh, it is an idiot mark when you come down to it. 
But in any event, today I guess it's pretty popular with everybody, male as well as female. But uh, I did uh, enjoy going to visit all these countries. It was like, a, excuse me, during peacetime, it was almost like a pleasure cruise. And we did a lot of training of midshipmen. And Annapolis people, we take them out on cruises and like that. Uh, I've been to a lot of countries. I think the, the most hospitable country I ever went to was Scotland. The Scottish people were fantastic. And I would have to say the Japanese people rank right up there too as far as hospitality goes. Now we were in Japan four years after the end of World War II, and yet those people didn't hold any animosity or anything. Mm -hmm. They welcomed us. Now when you were, did you go ashore in Japan? Oh yeah, yeah. Did, you, you, did you see the damage? Was there still a lot of damage? Well, there, there still was damage? a lot of damage. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, in England and Scotland, of course we were over in both of those places mm -hmm. and like that, the people were still on rationing. I know my, my buddy and myself, we met a couple of Scottish girls and we took them to the movie and they says, uh, shall we get some candy? And we says, yeah. Well, they says, we, we're rationed. We only can get so much. I says, God, I thought we won the war. And here we are. <laughs> Four years after, they're still on rationing over in Scotland. But no, there was a lot of damage, bomb damage in Glasgow. Where mm -hmm. was often, uh, we went into Glasgow, Scotland. We were anchored off the Firth of Forth. I liked that because it was right underneath the railroad bridge and I'd watch the trains go by because I'm a train <laughs> lover, you know. Mm -hmm. But in any event, uh, yes, there was a lot of damage over there. But I will say that the Japanese people really treated the Americans very, very well. Mm -hmm. And the uh, fact they'd invite, I wasn't a shore-based sailor, but fellows that were stationed on the shore would tell us they were invited over for uh, uh, meals and like that to the families and like that. They, they were very polite. I'll never forget... Uh, uh, the ship came back from, we'd like to go up on the bomb line and shoot for maybe about three or four months, then come back to Yakuska, Japan for resupply and like that, and that's when we got off the ship. Once now, what that, do you mean by the bomb line? The bomb line was like uh, above the 38th parallel oh, or wherever okay, in, okay. in Korea and like that. Mm -hmm. we'd, we'd almost go right up to Vladivostok, Russia. We were right in the Russian area and like that. So, uh, you know, we, we were pretty close to the Cold War enemy when we were shelling like up in Chunjin and like that. So, in any event, we'd come back to Japan and then we'd get off the ship and be able to, you know, go over ashore where they had ham and eggs and like that aboard the ship. You wouldn't get that stuff, you know, so everything was powdered and like that. So, we'd go down to the enlisted men's club and, and uh, have a meal, and uh, a, an American-style meal. i never forget, I'm walking along the street with a bunch of my, my buddies and this old Japanese grandfather, here he is with his two, two grandchildren, the kids have got balloons, and I looked at him and I said, these people aren't any different than we are. They didn't want any war or anything like that. Here he is doing what every guy, every grandfather is doing back home on a Saturday afternoon with his grandchildren. I asked him if I could take his picture, and I still got his picture mm -hmm. today, you know. But uh, how, they're, they're no different than we are. And uh, like I say, they treated us all very well. Of course, a lot of times you get the ugly American attitude, you know, that would cause a few incidents and like that. But overall, the Japanese were very, very receptive to us. The Scottish people were, we were there, I think, for, we had the midshipman cruise at that time. So you can imagine bringing thousands of sailors into, like, Edinburgh, Scotland, and Glasgow, Scotland, what it did for the economy. My God, economy, you know, would, would, would get a terrific shot in the arm. Well, a lot of fellas met uh, Scottish girls, and uh, when they went back to the States, they pulled 30 days leave and went back and got married. In fact, ironic enough, we got a great website, uh, USS Wisconsin a website, and it tells about, you know, who passed away and like that. Mm -hmm. and I'm looking at my website the, the other day, and uh, one of the fellows that married a Scottish girl, uh, his name was Paul Sylvia, I can still remember, he passed away. And I was telling my wife, I said, Paul married a, flew back and married a Scottish girl, and uh, here he is now, he's, he's, he's expired. But we do have this website uh, about the USS Wisconsin. It's got pictures and everything on it. In fact, I took a lot of pictures out of my photo album and sent them, sent them in to the fella. I think you call him the webmaster or something like that. But he puts them on uh, the website. He's very handy at it. And uh, I wrote him one day and I said to him that I was having a little bit of medical problems and like that. And I had to go through some treatment. And he put it on the, the website. I wound up getting 35 emails. Now, some of the fellas I knew, some were from World War II guys. And they were all saying, well, I went through it, and you'll be all right. And I saved them all. Would you believe it? 35 emails in about a day and a half. Mm -hmm. 
And some of these fellas I didn't even know. So I wrote back the webmaster. I said, you know, you got a website here that's almost like a family. And he said, well, he wrote me back. He said, that's what my wife and I try to do. Mm -hmm. But we have a reunions and like that. In fact, I went, went down to the ship's recommissioning in Pascagoula, Mississippi, just before a desert storm. And I went aboard the ship. I had my wife and my daughter with us. There were 14,000 people at, uh, at uh, Dockside to recommission the ship. And, of course, when you recommission a ship, it's really an event because they, they give the order, bring the ship back to life. And the whole crew was on the dock. And they run up the gangways, the aft gangway and the forward gangway, and they man the ship right up into the superstructure. With sailors all around the, uh, you know, the guardrails and like that. They lower the guns, they toot the horn, they make the smoke come out, they get the flashing lights. All the guns are right over your head and like that. It's quite a ceremony. And I, I really enjoyed that. I mean, I met a lot of the fellows that, you know, I served with and like that. Mm -hmm. That's one thing about the Navy. You, may, you meet some very good friends. In fact, uh, some of my buddies, one of my buddies was very artistic and like that. When I got married, he flew in from Chicago and sang at my wedding. Uh -huh. he, was, he was that good a singer. But, uh, now what happened to the Wisconsin? Where is it now? Well, the Wisconsin is a museum piece now down in uh, Portsmouth, Virginia, Norfolk. Okay. But it's in the, what they call the Ready Reserve. In other words, you can go down there and walk the main decks in the superstructure, but you can't go below decks because if they need it, they can bring it out. Mm -hmm. Now, the Missouri is a permanent uh, uh, museum piece alongside the Arizona. Mm -hmm. In other words, at Pearl Harbor you see right. where the war began and where the war ended. Uh, the Jersey is, uh, serves as a, uh, a visiting ship down in Bayonne, I think it is. In mm -hmm. fact, people can go aboard their Boy Scouts and spend the weekend. So that ship I don't think is anything in the Ready Reserve. Mm -hmm. And the Iowa, of course, had that disaster where the turret blew up yeah. and the Iowa was just put aside and like mm -hmm. that. That was a bad episode, Navy-wise, uh, when, the, when they had that uh, turret explosion. Mm -hmm. But in any event, the Wisconsin would be the one to uh, go to go to war. Wisconsin is the newest one, mm -hmm. and it's the biggest one. It's got a, I think it's eight inches longer than, anybody else, than the other ships. Our captain used to brag about that. Mm -hmm. One thing about the Wisconsin that I used to have a, get a big kick out of was uh, they'd assigned these officers there that were captains, and then just before they made Rear Admiral, they had to be commander of a capital ship. So we used to have, the last two uh, captains that I served with aboard the Wisconsin were submarine men. And boy, they used to like to play with that battleship, you know, <laughs> going from a submarine to a battleship. We're in the port of Norfolk, and usually we had two or three tugboats come and get us out and bring us out into the bay and turn us around and point us uh, out to sea. We're, we got all the lines uh, cast off from the dock. And all of a sudden, we're moving. He said, Where, where's the tugboats? He didn't, he didn't use any tugboats. He just pulled it away like a car and took off, <laughs> took off for the horizon. I said, these people are really something. But that's how we got hurt, because the captain was too close. He was too close to the shore. The battleship you know, shouldn't have been that close to shore. But they liked to get in close. Mm -hmm. I think they got in so close, they'd have the anti-aircraft guns, uh, 40 millimeters firing at those railroad trains that we had stalled on the shore. And I'll give you an idea how close we'd be in the, in the shore. But in any event, I used to have to admire the way that they would play around with the battleship like it was their little submarine. And of course, if they were ever operating in an area where there was one of their friends or their submarine was in that area, the submarine would come out of the water and come alongside of us and we'd give them ice cream or whatever goodies they didn't have. You know? It was really, really interesting. But uh, being in the Navy is something that when I was in, maybe I couldn't wait to get out. <laughs> the thing is, I, I would repeat it. It, it, was a, it was a great experience, and uh, I think that every young guy should, should go through it. Mm -hmm. uh, it really uh, it was my college. I mean, really, I didn't go, never went to college and like that. I put four years in there, and uh, that, that I consider my college education. But it was a great education. You met a lot of people from in America and like that. Uh, fellow Americans, and you met a lot of people overseas. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did a lot of traveling overseas. If, if you could prove that you had a relative or something like that, and you were in like a port like uh, Lake Horn, Italy, well, they'd let you go. You'd put in for it, and they'd give you five days to go off the ship, and you'd travel around to, to meet these people and like that. So, of course, when you met those people, it was like a... a uh, an American, a big pers person coming to a little village to meet uh -huh. him like that. It was like a major event, you know. But I enjoyed that. 
In fact, I went over and visited a, an Italian soldier that my brother, who was in the American Army in Germany, had befriended in Germany. Of course, during the war, Italy went against Germany, so all those Italian soldiers that were stationed in Germany with the German Army, they became prisoners of war. So after the war, uh, the Americans uh, got there, peace was declared, but you couldn't fraternize with the German people because it was a court-martial offense. So the guys that took over whatever houses, the American soldiers took over whatever houses they could, uh, they could find that were still standing like that, and they just hung around until they were waiting to be demobilized and go back to America. So they wanted to have somebody wash their clothes or take care of their odds and ends, and my brother struck upon the idea of asking one of these Italian soldiers to come over and be their janitor. Mm -hmm. So he found an older man, and he whatever little Italian he could talk, he went over and he said, would you like to come and live with us and be our go-between between between us and the German people to get our clothes done or whatever errands they wanted to do or things they wanted done for them. So they took him aboard. And, of course, he hadn't heard from his family in Italy. He didn't know whether or not they survived the war. So my mother, who was a great person with ideas and like that, she could read and write two languages. She said to my brother, have him write a letter, put it in your letter, and sent it to Saratoga, which they did. This guy's name was Marco Bianconi, and he was a fascist, a real fascist. Because I went to visit, I wound up visiting the fella when I was in the Navy. So in any event, he writes the letter to my mother in Saratoga. My mother puts his letter in a letter to her, my cousin, her nephew, who was stationed in, of all places, Lake Horn, Italy, where I departed from to go see Marco. So in any event, with instructions, put it in the Italian mail system, because by that time, everything was being reorganized and like that. The war was over with. Have his wife, if she's still alive, and he had a daughter and a father, have her write the letter to you. You send it to Saratoga. <laughs> I'll send it to Germany. And that's the way Marco found out that his family was still alive. So we, my mother more or less uh, had a relationship with his wife. We used mm -hmm. to send him care packages from Saratoga, soap and cigarettes and like that. So when he found out I was in the Navy and headed to the, I got aboard another ship, the USS Midway, to make a Mediterranean cruise because the battleship wasn't allowed to go into the Mediterranean. It had some kind of naval treaty and like that. So I transferred in my last two years in the service. I went aboard the aircraft carrier Midway and I made a Mediterranean cruise. So the minute Marco found out through the mails, because my mother, mother would correspond with his wife, he says, have Gene, you know, come and visit me. Mm -hmm. So my mother sends me, I don't know how to get to the guy and like that, the place's name was Massa Martin. It wasn't in any world atlas or anything. So my mother rips a page out of a book, puts an X near a place called Perugia. She says, he lives near there. <laughs> I got it. I got it aboard. She says, how am I going to find this? I only had five days to do it because we were going to be in Lake Horn five days. If you didn't get back, you were AWOL and you had to turn yourself into the American Embassy. So in any event, we had uh, three or four Italian officers that, that were uh, working with us, uh, observing our maneuvers and like that. So I said, let me go up and ask these guys. They're Italian or from Italy. They must know where this place is at. So I went up and I said to them, in my best Italian and like that, you know, excuse me, could you tell me where Massa Martin is? They said, we don't know. And I said, oh, what am I going to do, you know? I, I want to do it, and i got to do it. I'll never get the, another opportunity to do it. So they said, go, you'll find your way and like that. So in any event, I put in for the five days and like that, and they said, go ahead. So I gathered up jackknives, pocket watches, cigarettes, whatever I could carry to bring this fellow and like that. I got on a train. They let me off the, off the ship at 8 o'clock in the morning. I got on the train. I only had a limited amount of money. I'm in the Navy. You know, I don't have $100, $200 on me. I got on a train. The fellow said to me, the ticket agent, hurry up. The train's in the station. Go on up there and get aboard and like that. So I took off and I got up there and I got in my seat and I'm figuring out the exchange rate, American dollars to lira. He goofed me out of five dollars. He cheated me out of five bucks. And I'm saying to myself, boy, this is really good. I'm off on, off on this trip on a good foot. Now what am I going to do? If I go down and argue with him, he'll call the cops. There was no shore patrol over American policemen off the ship yet. I says, and I won't even get on the trip. So I had to swallow it, and I says, I just got to be careful or I'm going to go broke. And, you know, if you don't have any money, what are you going to do? So in any event, the first stop I made was Florence, Italy. Now, Florence, Italy was bigger than Grand Central Station. And here I am, and these trains are backing up and leaving and backing up. So I saw a AAA, and I went over and I said to him, I want to go to Perugia, and I got to get a train out of here to go to Perugia. 
So the lady said, well, they do back in over here. Listen to the loudspeaker. Well, I couldn't hear the loudspeaker. The guy's talking in Italian, blatant like that, you know. So I went over to this fellow that was like a station uh, master and like that. And I said to him, I want to go to Perugia. Do I get on any of these trains? He said, no. I said, well, I have to get a train to Perugia. He I kept on bothering him. He grabbed me right by the collar and sat me right down in the chair. And he says in Italian, I sat. In other words, sit down. So I sat there and I watched these trains pull in leave and like that and I look up to him he wouldn't he'd just ignore me and I said boy I hope he puts me on the right train or I'm going to be off to a start and I'll be st stuck here in Florence and I don't want to be stuck in Florence that's a big city so in any event the trains would pull, it'd pull in and then leave and like that so I'd look up to him and he'd go never say anything he'd give me the windshield wiper deal and another train came in so finally, he gets me by the collar again. He's like, go on, Vatin. You know, it's, it's like, it threw me out like that. Go on, get going. Get on that train over there. So I get on the train. I walk in the last car, and here's benches on each side. And I says, I'm not going to sit here. It was just benches. I kept on walking, and the next set of cars were a little bit better. Then I got up to the, uh, the other <coughs> set of cars, and here's these men, businessmen in a compartment, four of them. They're all reading their newspapers and like that. So I open up the door. I got in. I got right on the, the end of the, the seat and like that. They, they, didn't, they didn't even acknowledge me. Didn't even look at me or anything. You know, I'm in a uniform. I mean, you don't see a, uh, American servicemen way in and like that, you know. So in any event, the conductor comes along. He opens up the door. I give him my tickets. He give me one of these jobs. The windshield wiper effect. So I, I give him one of these jobs. What do you want? He says, your ticket is second class. This is first class. So a light bulb went on in my head. I said, well, how much more money you need? I want to sit here, you know? So in other words, it's quando sold uh, you need and like mm -hmm. that. I was pretty good at Italian. I did bring my, my translation book, but I never used it. Surprising enough, when you got to do something, you'll do it. You won't have any problem. So in any event, uh, I paid him and he let me sit there. The whole trip, these fellas never acknowledged me at all. So I get in this place, Perugia, now it's nighttime. And the station is way out in the country, just like the Saratoga station is. Mm -hmm. Nobody around and like that. I said, no, how, how am I going to get into the city? This guy says to me, hey, American sailor. I says, my God, somebody talks English. He comes up he says, I says, you speak English? He says, yeah, I used to live in Newark, New Jersey. <laughs> I says, you're just the guy I'm looking for. So yeah, I said, take me to a hotel, and tomorrow morning at 6 o'clock, you've got to get me on the train to Massa Martana. He says, okay. So I went to the hotel. The guy says, uh, uh, supper's being served, you know, go up to your room and like that. Come on down and you'll be ready for supper and like that. So about that time, I hadn't talked English to anybody too much in the whole trip. And it gets kind of kind of lonesome, you know, yeah. by myself. So in any event, I came down to supper and I sat alongside three British couples. You know, and they just ignored me too. And I'm saying, what's, what's wrong with me? Nobody wants to talk to me. Usually people would say, oh, you're an American, at least the English, because they know American servicemen, you know. Nobody would talk to me. So ironically enough, the room he gives me is, guess what, the bridal suite. <laughs> of, all, of all places, the bridal suite. I got a room that looks like a bone alley. You know what I mean? So the next morning, the fellow's there. He puts me on a train. And I get on a train and... <laughs> excuse me, I went up to this place, Massa Martana, and I had to get a bus into the village. So in any event, I talked to the young fellow, he was a station master, and I used to say to him, I used to like to say to the people, how was it during the war, and like that, you know. And I'd say to the kid, how was it during the war? Oh, he says, the American bombers are terrible. I says, why? Well, he says, instead of hitting the railroad yards, they'd always hit the houses. <laughs> they were always off course or something like that. So in any event, I got on the bus, and the word must have got up to the, the village or the little hamlet there. There was this guy, the minute the bus pulled in, he's got on these riding britches, uh, he was a tenant farmer, sport coat, pork pie hat, black armband around him and like that, and I knew it was him. And uh, that's how I met up with Marco. So I stood with him for about three or four days, but you talk about tough living. They did all their cooking over a fireplace. Mm -hmm. He was the tenant farmer, but the food was good. God, we had everything from lamb to chicken, you name it. Everything was done over the fireplace. And uh, the, on a Sunday there before I left, I met the the padrone, they call him. In other words, the man who owns the landlord and like that. And by that time, I was talking politics and everything with these people. Communism versus democracy. Mm -hmm. I was really at it, you know. So what he did, before he put me on the train, he put me on the train in Assisi. That's where they have a big Catholic shrine, St. Francis of oh, Assisi. Yeah. And my brother's name was Francis. So he says, I want to take you over there and uh, 
and to show you the shrine. So we had the village uh, uh, priest get in a car, and I said, don't spend any money, because I'm going to give you a little money I can. I like that. No, I said, I want, want to take you to the shrine. So there was Marco, the driver, the priest, me, and his 11-year-old daughter. And we went around the, the area to go over to Assisi, and the Catholic priest gave me a whole tour of that, that shrine. Of course, now, a couple of years ago, it was hit by an earthquake, but it destroyed a lot of it. But I had a whole tour of that, courtesy of a, an English-speaking uh, Italian uh, priest, you know. It was, it was quite a trip and a thing that, uh, like I say, I'll never forget. And that was one of the great things about being in the Navy. But then, uh, like I say, to go to the Mediterranean, I had to transfer aboard the USS Midway, which was an aircraft here, the biggest one at that time. I served uh, aboard the two biggest ship, ships in the fleet up to the 1950s. Of course, now you see the Kennedy and mm -hmm. the, the American like that, they're, the Reagan, they're, they're humongous, they're, they're, they're gigantic. But at that time, they, they were the two biggest ships in the fleet. So uh, basically, uh, I never had a chance to get seasick too much. <laughs> now you said uh, while you were in the Midway there was a collision? Yeah, what we did, uh, we, an oiler came alongside of the ship to give us jet fuel and like that. Mm -hmm. And the, the water was rough. It was a rough season like that. And what happened, uh, the seas brought the tanker right into the side of the ship. And they got hung up. Well, when the tanker pulled back, he pulled off pretty near every gun mount on the port side of the ship. The barrels were crossed like that. It was just a wreck. Well, we had only been over there now for about three months. We were headed for Piraeus, Piraeus Greece, which was the port of Athens. And I said, my God, we're going to go back to, uh, to the Navy Yard already. I said, this is no good. I come over on the ship to make a, a year-long Mediterranean cruise, mm -hmm. and here it is with all this wreckage we got on the, the port size. We'll never be able to operate like that. They'll send us back home. You know what they did? They says, okay, they had a meeting. They says, the ship's crew will repair the ship, and that's what we did. We, we uh, of course, I was a real uh, part of that because I was a metalsmith and a ship fitter. But we, what we did, we salvaged whatever we could in the way of the gun mounts and like that, burned off all the damaged parts, made it watertight, painted it, and covered all that area with white canvas. That's the way we operated for 10 months with the whole side of the ship inoperative. If we'd ever had an air raid or a Pearl Harbor deal, you'd, there wouldn't have been any, uh, any, any defense on that side of the ship. But they kept us out there because they didn't have a replacement ready. Mm -hmm. And the Sixth Fleet had to have a major carrier there, and we were it. And we had relieved the Coral Sea, which was just like the Midway, and they were, went back to the States. But uh, when they says that, you know, the crew will do the, will do the repair work, we worked around the clock. We worked five days, 24 hours. Uh, you know, cutting off all of the damaged metal, all the collision metal, dumping it in the port there. That's like, must have an iron bottom down there now. And we uh, patched it all up, made it watertight, and we were ready for sea. And that's the way we operated for 10 months. Come back to the States with that white canvas on that side of the ship. But uh, on the carrier, that was very exciting uh, duty because, you know, you're always landing these jets and like that. And... Uh, Strangely enough, or, you know, you do have a lot of accidents, mm -hmm. and you see a lot of uh, fires. God, when they have a wreck, you'd say to yourself, how are we ever going to put it out? Of course, we were what they call ship's company, and our area was below the flight deck. The air company, they call them Airedales, their, their point of responsibility was everything from the hangar bay up. Mm -hmm. So if they had a fire on a flight deck, they didn't call us away. If, the fire, if they needed us, they would call us away. So it was usually the air, air group that fought the fire. And some of those fires, you'd, you'd look and you'd say, my God, we're going to blow up, you know. But they'd get it out because they still had planes flying that had to land. Mm -hmm. And they were short on fuel. What they would do, they'd get this big cherry picker, they called it. It was like a big crane. The guy would go right into the center of the fire, just dump it all right overboard. Whatever's burning and uh, whatever isn't burning. That area, you just push it right overboard. And before you know it, they'd have the fire out. They were great firefighters, and of course, fire is one of the things that you really fear aboard a ship. Uh, Surprise enough, you're on water, but if that metal thing catches on fire, you've got big problems. But in any event, they were great firefighters, and that right there was attributable to their, their fire training. But uh, I, uh, I put the, the four years in, and... Uh, Ironically enough, I'm going to say something here that I'm a little embarrassed about. 
I can't swim. <laughs> <laughs> and I had 45 months of sea duty. Would wow. you believe it? If I ever fell overboard, I'm a gone goose. So I stood, always made sure I knew where life jackets were at, where life preservers are at. Now, why I joined the Navy, I said, i got to go. I know I have to go into service or I'm going to get drafted. But at the same time, I'll learn how to swim. So in any event, when we went down to training, they issued us a swimsuit like that. The days that we went to swimming class, it was heaven for the guys that could swim. It was a day, of, day off. You didn't have to march or anything like that. For us, it was hell. <laughs> so one day we went into swimming class. And they had maybe about 100 life jackets or a couple hundred piled in the corner. We were all saying amongst ourselves, because we were already broken apart like swimmers and non-swimmers. We were saying amongst ourselves, boy, today we're going to get life jackets on and we'll be able to you know, go in the water and have some fun down the, the big pool. We were in the, the shallow pool. So in any event, the order came out, he says, okay, fellas, he says, those of you that can't swim, grab a life jacket. Those that can't swim, climb the tower. Well, boy, the, you ought to hear the hoots and the hollers and the earth. And, you know, of course, I had five guys from my city. They tell everybody he can't swim worth a lick, you know what I mean, like that. And they're whistling and hollering, you know, who's going to chicken out and like that. Well, the worst thing you can do is chicken out and not do it. So... Went up on a, the ladder, and it, it simulates uh, the side of a ship. Mm -hmm. Better than two and a half stories, you know. Mm -hmm. So when you get up there, the two officers on each side of the thing, they'd say, now, son, you know, when you jump off, go off like a projectile with your hands at your side. So I'm up there, and, of course, I never jumped in the pool <laughs> that high, or and I'm afraid of heights, too. So in any event... <laughs> I go off, and I'll, on the way down, I could hear him whistling and hollering, and watch this, you know, watch when he comes up. I'd come up, I couldn't see anything because of the chlorine and like that. Well, finally, I'd go down, up and down. I nearly swallowed half the pool, you know. They'd get poles. I couldn't find a life rings or anything. They, they'd push me in the shore. When they got me out of the pool, the officer said to me, he says, hey, kid, they want you up on the tower again. I said, just, just jumped off, you know. So I says, me? He says, yeah, you go on up on the tower. So as I'm climbing up, all the other guys had already jumped off and like that. As I'm climbing up, there's a fella, I'll never forget his name, Holmesy. And Holmesy was so deathly afraid of the water that in training camp, we used to, we used to have to give him a shower. He's one of those guys, you know what I mean? You give him a shower with a, with a scrub brush, you know. So as I'm coming up, I get here, the two officers saying, Holmesy, now son, you're going to have to jump if we stay here all night. <laughs> and as I'm coming up, I say, Holmesy, are you going to jump? Because I knew if I got up there and you know, he's up in front of me hesitating, I won't do it either, you know. So I says, Holmesy, are you going to jump? He says, uh, no. I says, well, then get out of the way because I am. So as I got over there, the officer said, now, wait a minute. How did we tell you to jump off here? I says, you told me to keep my hands at my side and go down like a, a projectile. He said, well, when you went off the last time, it looked like you were trying to grab something on the way down. <laughs> <laughs> Off I went again, and boy, I had a cheer section like you won't believe. So in any event, they finally fished me out, and the officer said to me, he says, you know, kid, you can't swim worth a damn, but you got nerve. <laughs> but the thing is, if you didn't do it, and you went back to the barracks, the guys would never let you forget it, you know? So you almost had to do it. But uh, in any event... Yes, you know, one time was you ever scared? Yeah, you were scared, uh, and everybody got pretty close to religion when you uh, saw that they were shooting back at us, you know what I mean? And uh, it, it is kind of scary and like that. And uh, uh, I know like where we were at down below, you never knew what was going on up, up topside. One fellow had the phones and like that. So the day that we heard the 40 millimeters going off, we thought that we were being attacked by airplanes. And the 40 millimeter gun was World War II vintage. And at that time they had jets. And the 40 millimeter was no, no uh, comparison to fight a, a jet attack. Mm -hmm. So we were down below in our area, locked in and like that. The whole ship is uh, locked in. All the doors are all shut. And uh, we thought we were under air attack. And everybody's saying to the guy on the phone, what are they doing up there? What are they doing up there? Well, he said they're firing at a train. So we were, we were happy about that. We didn't want any air attack. We said, my God, even though we had a lot of guns, we had about 10 uh, quad 40s. There were four barrels to a, a, a mount, gun mount. Uh, they wouldn't be any comparison for a jet attack or anything like that. Now, did you ever have any close encounters with the Russian Navy at all? Yes, uh, we were in, the, not the Navy, but the merchant, merchant uh, Navy, the Russian Merchant Navy. We were uh, anchored in Gibraltar, 
and somebody says, hey, here, you didn't see any Russian ships at that time. That wasn't really at the, the height of the Russian Navy in the Cold War. The Russians were building up their Navy at that time. So what happened, uh, you never see a Russian man of war. But as we were anchored in the port of Gibraltar, in comes this Russian, Russian merchant ship. Of course, the word went all over the ship. It was a Sunday afternoon. Hey, there's a Russian ship going to cross our bow. So we all went up, and there's the hammer and sickle on the bow. Well, the wise guys in the gun mounts, they were lowering their mounts, training them right on the Russian ship. He probably said, these Americans are really something else. Every guy in the gun mount was training his guns right on the ship. You know? But in it, that's the only Russian uh, Navy appearance I saw in the whole Mediterranean. Of course, maybe they had submarines in there following us. Who knew, you know what I mean? But that's the only Russian sh ship. It was a merchant ship. No one off the coast of Korea or anything? No, they, they stood right up there. We got awful close to them in a, in a way, you know, you're almost daring them and like that. When you're almost up to Vladivostok, which is one of their big ports up in the, you know, the northern part of uh, uh, that area, you're getting pretty close to them. And, uh, of course, they were very careful when, when they went up that way, so they knew where they were at. No, no accidental deals where you might shell a Russian uh, a property or anything like that, you know. But uh, it was very, very cold over there. We were over there in the wintertime, and you'd get a lot of snowstorms and like that. It was very, very cold, and the water very, very rough. What about uh, your personal equipment? Did you have... Uh, all flower weather gear. Okay. Yeah. Now, one time we took aboard a North Korean uh, prisoner of war, he was wounded, and of course we had great medical <coughs> facilities aboard the, the battleship and like that, so they brought him aboard the ship, and they tried to save his life, but uh, they couldn't save his life and like that, so what they did, they decided to uh, bury him at sea with honors, and of course that right there is an event that you don't forget either when you bury somebody at sea. But they gave him all the honors, Paul Bearers, uh, Fire and Squad, and everything, uh, rendered him the full military honors uh, as a fellow serviceman. But uh, we had the president of South Korea come aboard the ship. And we uh, were anchored off uh, uh, Pusan, Korea. And Sigmund Rhee and his wife came aboard because uh, we were carrying the Admiral of the 7th Fleet. And uh, he, they came aboard and exchanged medals and like that. It was a funny day because uh, we were anchored there for a couple of days waiting for the, the President Rhee to come aboard and like that. Of course, we all had to dress up like we were going home on leave in, in dress uniform. P code, all our uh, main uh, uni blue uniform and like that, and we had to line the rails and like that, and they hoisted the uh, United Nations flag alongside the American flag. He came aboard, and of course, uh, him and the Admiral were going to exchange medals and have dinner and like that, and they said, for the benefit of the crew, the Korean Symphony Orchestra is going to come aboard. So they were bringing them, we were anchored out in the harbor, so they were bringing them aboard by launches, uh, motor launches and like that. So of course we were all curious because they had a lot of girls in the orchestra and like they're watching them come aboard. All of a sudden this guy comes aboard, he's about six foot three, he's a Korean fella carrying a clarinet. And we're saying, hey, we're here defending your country and you've got a clarinet. <laughs> that, that went over big, you know, this guy comes aboard with a clarinet. <laughs> now there was a lot of fun times in the service though and uh, like I say, you met a lot of uh, a lot of nice people that you you still keep in contact with today, mm -hmm. 50 years later. Mm -hmm. So you still have contact with oh, yeah. quite a few that yeah. served with you. Yeah, yeah, I have contacts. One strange thing happened to me. I worked in City Hall right up the street up here, and I worked in the assessment office. And this fellow comes in one day, real distinguished looking gentleman, and he says uh, he wanted to find a hand melon farm over in Skylerville. So I says, oh, that's no problem. You stay right on this road. You're going to get there and like that. So I had a picture of the USS Saratoga on the wall. So he says, were you on that ship? I says, no. I says, I'm a battleship sailor. I says, I was on the, which one were you on? He said, I says, on the Wisconsin. So the more I looked at him and like that, he says, I was a commanding officer. He was my skipper. Walked right in off the street. Would you believe it? So I said, what are you doing up here? He said, my son is stationed out to West Milton. He's a nuclear submarine man. And me and my wife come up and visit him every once in a while. So every time he would come and visit, he'd come into City Hall. And, of course, the fellow I worked with was a retired lieutenant commander submarine man from West Mill. He uh, retired in Saratoga. So we'd sit there and we'd have a grand old chat, you know. So he comes up once. We used to have to work a half a day Saturday. So I'm out at the mailbox and there he is going in the City Hall door with a, a burlap bag under his arm. So 
we used to call him Admiral. I said, hey, by that time he made an Admiral. I says, hey, Admiral, what, where are you going? He said, well, I got something for you. So I went in the office and he says, I won't be coming back. My son is getting transferred, so this is my last visit here. I wanted you to have this picture. And he gave me a framed picture with a brass plate on it of the USS Wisconsin mm -hmm. anchored in Japan with his name signed on the mm -hmm. back. So when, when we went to, so when we went to Mississippi for the recommissioning, I thought I'd run into him. But he was in a nursing home, oh. and I never did see the man. But what a, what a gentleman. But wasn't that something? Came right in off the street, and the more we talked, well, I was so excited. I like to fall through the floor. I had to take him and introduce him to Mayor Jones and all the people and like that. He got a big kick out of it, you know. And we talk about the Navy. Ah, oh, the Navy's falling apart. You know, it isn't <laughs> like when we were in the Navy. See, what we used to say, like, uh, years ago you had wooden ships and iron men. Now you got iron ships and wooden men. <laughs> <laughs> comparing a lot to that, you know. But we really enjoyed his company, and I think he enjoyed ours, you know. Mm -hmm. that, 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 that was really ironic that uh, this person walks in off the street and he winds up to be my commanding officer. Uh, did you join any veterans organizations after you? Yeah, uh, I'm vice service? commander of the Korean uh, War Veterans, mm -hmm. and uh, we have our, our own group. I belong to the Legion and the Italian American War Veterans and mm -hmm. like that. But, uh, and I'm involved in a lot of veterans things. We do this honor of deceased veteran of the month, and it's a very popular uh, for the families. It's like a sort of a closure. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we do that down the county the third Tuesday of every month. And to date, we've done about over uh, 115 veterans. And a lot of preparation to it. Mm -hmm. Could you hold this uh, like this and uh, you know, focus on it? Tell us sure. where and when that was taken. This was taken... The, on the, when I first got down to Norfolk, Virginia, I was a seaman apprentice, as you can see, the two stripes on the left arm. And that was one of the first pictures I took in uniform to send home to my mother and my father and my brothers and sisters. But uh, I can still remember the arcade where everybody used to go and get their pictures taken. Of course, the first thing you did when you were out of boot camp and aboard a ship, you got your picture taken. And that's the number one picture taken that I had uh, in the Navy. And uh, it's uh, two stripes, seaman apprentice. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much for your interview. Okay, thank you very much. It was